Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. Good morning. Happy Thursday, I think it is. <laughs> um, thank you for coming in today. I think most of you know who I am, but since we're launching a uh, stream of our training today, I think we have someone signed in. Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Uh, my name is Dr. Carla, and I'm going to be tag teaming with my colleagues, Eric Johnson and Shushan Joshi. Did I say that right? I am so proud of myself. Um, and we're going to kind of tag team and walk you through uh, biofeedback and um, energy-based interventions in the work that we do. So we are grateful that you took the time to come in today so that we can share with you. Um, it's going to be a really intense three hours of information to share. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and start on your feedback training. We're probably going to go all the way through to about an hour. Then we'll take a break so that we can transition to the biofeedback room where we can do a demonstration for those of you who do have the time and you're able to, to view. And then when we come back from that break, Eric is going to do um, his presentation on other biofeedback modalities. And then thankfully we'll end with Shu, <laughs> who will soothe our brains <laughs> after we've consumed all the information that we're going to be consuming this morning. So once again, thank you for being here. Um, we probably won't have a lot of time initially for Q and A's in my part of the presentation, but I think what we'll do is after all three of us have presented, we'll come together at the end. And so as you have questions when you're going through, you can make note of them and then we'll, we, we can share with you after we've all presented. Does that work for everybody? All right, so we're gonna get started. So Eric is my technology guru, so from time to time I may have to call on him to help me navigate this. Um, so like I said before, my section of the training is going to be specifically on neurofeedback. So while I wait for technology to catch up with me, um, so I'm going to be looking at kind of a broad overview of what neurofeedback training is. And we have our computer doing updates here. I hope it doesn't interrupt with anything that's going on here. Did I just hit close program? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> and so for today, our broad objectives um, include one, describing what is neurofeedback. So at the end of our training today, I'm hoping that when you leave, you'll be able to identify and define what is neurofeedback. And also, we're hoping that you will increase your knowledge, awareness, and understanding of how neurofeedback can be applied in clinical practice. So before we get started, I'm going to try to see if I can switch over into a quick video and I may need Eric to help me to do this. Um, okay. This is not the right one though. Where is all this? What is my feedback? Physiological activity that is going on inside your body and nervous system is a process that is constantly changing, moving, and responding. It responds to what happens in the outer world around you, but also to your inner world of thought, perception, and emotion. Indicators like heart rate, respiration, blood circulation, body temperature, and others adjust themselves constantly based on the feedback they get from the body's inbuilt sensors to find the optimal balance and state. These vital rhythms define your very life, your health, wellness, and performance. But what if this activity is out of balance? Many modern health problems, such as tension headaches, stress-related anxiety, hyperventilation, high blood pressure, 
and forms of chronic pain, as well as attention and mental performance problems, stem from neurobiological dysfunctions, as well as from behavior and lifestyle patterns. In that case, we should not simply only rely on pills and medication. Lifestyle, stress, or in other words, behavior, can also be a cause for health and performance problems. Many researchers, clinicians, and health professionals are becoming increasingly interested to understand the role of the human nervous system and behavior in health and performance. This is the exciting scientific field where psychology and physiology meet. Biofeedback and neurofeedback refer to technology which enables us to literally see what the body is doing in real time. It's like having a mirror in which we can see the physiological signals of the mind-body system. And this enables us to notice and learn how to gain control over our physiological state, our stress levels, attention and performance. At Mind Media, since 1992, we have led major advances in this field with one simple goal, to create the best bio and neurofeedback technology ever. Now discover the Nexus system and Biotrace software. So um, just so you know, we're not endorsing any particular brand of this technology. It just so happens that this is a model that we have, and it really gives a, a quick and really good overview of what neurofeedback training is. And so a lot of the images that you see um, is what we have in our biofeedback room because they, we got our technology from them. All right, so let's see if we can pick up where we were. Okay, so um, quick disclaimer and also wanted to give acknowledgement to the Institute for Applied Neuroscience. A lot of the material that I prepared for presentation today is based on training that I received with them um, in Ash Ash Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, Professor Ed Hamlin did the training and so what I'm going to try to do today is to condense a week's worth of training in one hour. So I'm giving you fair notice that I may need to have neurofeedback done when I'm done with this presentation, as, as may you. So um, these are some of the areas that Dr. Hamlin uh, covered in that week, and we're going to be touching briefly on some of those. So basic neurophysiology and anatomy, um, instrumentation and electronics, and a little bit more about what EEGs are and how we use them uh, for biofeedback training. Um, he also walked us through research and neurofeedback training, um, developing protocols for different kinds of clinical conditions, current trends in neurofeedback, as well as some of the ethical and professional considerations. 
So what is biofeedback? And you did get a sense from the initial uh, video presentation that biofeedback is technology that really allows us to track what's going on in our bodies physiologically. So there are certain things, as I'm talking here, there are lots of things that are going on right now physiologically in my body, but they've been, <clears throat> they're, they're automatic, so I'm not consciously aware of what's going on. And so what biofeedback technology allows us to do is to track and monitor what's going on in our body's physiological. So what are some of those areas and systems that we can track? Blood pressure, for example, or breathing rate, heart rate, hand temperature, and specifically for neurofeedback, what we're tracking and monitoring and assessing is for brain waves. And so what neurofeedback allows us to do is to use technology to track and monitor what's going on with our brain waves so that we have control over producing the kinds of brain waves that we need for <clears throat> the tasks at hand. And so just a, a quick example, if you look at the image there, the first one, so thermal biofeedback uses technology that helps us to change our body temperature, right? So the image of the thermometer is kind of the feedback device. So the thermometer provides information on what's, on what's going on. For example, with someone who is highly anxious, perhaps their hands are cold and clammy. And so using the technology, which in this case would be the thermometer, you're able to, to help the patient to reduce anxiety by perhaps increasing their blood pressure, right? And so in the same manner with neurofeedback, I think that image says it all, right? So we're able to track what's going on in the brain so that we see what's going on with the brain waves. And if we know what's going on with the brain waves, we can adjust, we can change so that that person is producing the right kind of brain waves for the task that they have to complete at hand. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. What is neurofeedback? According to the Biofeedback Certification International Alliance, like I said before, um, neurofeedback training is a type of biofeedback training. And so what it helps us to do is to track the state of our physiological functioning. And the, what distinguishes neurofeedback from other kinds of biofeedback is that we focus on regulating the arousal in our central nervous system and the brain. So we're not regulating necessarily, our blood pressure will be affected, but specifically if we're able, we're tracking and monitoring our brain waves and changing what we produce to match the tasks that we have to complete. So for neurofeedback and biofeedback interventions in general, there are principles that you're very familiar with. They're grounded in theory and research, and so You've heard of operant conditioning and classical conditioning. Neurofeedback training is based on those foundational principles in the field. And so when you think of what operational conditioning is, it's a process of learning um, by applying reinforcement to a target behavior, for example, that you want to see. So I think for most of us in the work that we do, if you think about kids diagnosed with behavior disorders, you want to produce a certain kind of behavior that you want to see. And in order for us to do that, we have to apply some kind of reinforcement so you get the desired behavior. The more you reinforce that behavior is the more of it you're going to see. I think attention can be a powerful reinforcer, right? So if a kid is yelling and screaming all the time and throwing attention when they don't get their own way, if we keep giving attention to that behavior, is it likely to increase or decrease? What do you think it's going to do? increase, right? So we learn that we can change the reinforcers so that we change the outcome of the behavior. So if we take away attention from the tantruming, it's likely to, de to decrease. But if we keep giving attention to the tantruming behavior, they're going to keep doing it. So just foundational principles of learning is what guides the field of neurofeedback training. I think you're also familiar with, with Pavlov's work. So essential fundamental principles of classical conditioning. When we uh, pair, constantly pair a neutral stimulus, and in this case, the neutral stimulus is a bell, with an unconditional stimulus, which in this case is a bone for the dog, the more we make that association, the stronger that association becomes, pretty soon both stimuli are going to produce the same behavior. So initially Pavlov presented the bone, and as soon as he did that, what happened? the dog started to salivate. When he paired the bone with a bell, constantly that association and connection between the bone and the bell produced the same outcome. So after a while, he didn't have to present the bone because 
there was an association made. When that association happens, learning happens. So the dog learned that when he sees the bell, it means that food is coming. So he didn't have to see the bone before he salivated because that association was so strong. Again, and, and that would be the principle behind learning as well. So neurofeedback training is no different in the sense that what we're doing is reinforcing the brain to produce the brain waves that we wanted to produce. How did neurofeedback emerge in the field? Um, neurofeedback essentially emerged out of the movement and the developments in um, neuroscience. And so what's happening now is that because of the developments in neuroscience, neuroscience is beginning to really shape and inform the work that we do in psychology, psychiatry, counseling, and education. Neuroplasticity is probably one of the most transformational discoveries um, in neuroscience. For decades, we were taught um, that we're born with predetermined numbers of brain cells, and if those brain cells die, we never recover them. And so neuroscience completely flipped that on its head because what we learned, in fact, happens is that as our brains are pruning and changing and the cells are dying, they're actually regenerating themselves. So our brains have the amazing capacity to, to be rewired even when there's traumatic insult or injury to the brain, our brains can regrow brand new cells so that we continue to, to learn and grow and adapt um, with trauma, for example, and adversity that we face. So it's an amazing discovery in the field. And so this is the kind of um, background from which neurofeedback training evolved. One of the pioneers in the field for neurofeedback is Dr. Barry Sturman. He um, was heavily engaged in sleep research uh, several decades ago. One of his primary areas of focus is what is the role of the EEG in normal sleep? And we're going to talk a lot about the EEG um, much later on in the training. And so he actually discovered, uh, in a sense, this work by accident. He was asked by NASA to research the effects of human exposure to rocket fuel. And for his experiments, he utilized cats. And so what he found in the process of his experiment is that when he used rocket fuel to induce seizures in cats, there was an amazing um, ability in terms of being able to be resilient to the seizures. And so what he discovered by accident was that there is a brainwave frequency that measures between 12 and 15 hertz. Um, I'm going to try to see if I can get the pointer going uh, to show you. So can you see where the pointer is? So what he discovered was that there's a brainwave frequency that measures 12 to 15 hertz that occurred over the sensory motor cortex, which would be that dark brown area and that orangish area right there. And he termed that SMR for sensory motor rhythm. And so when he discovered that, he used the principles of operant conditioning to actually teach the cats to be resilient to seizures when they're um, induced by rocket fuel. And so he used those principles to train the cats to increase their SMR brainwaves. And he was able to publish very convincing data about how this affected the cats. Yeah. I don't have all the details of the research, but I can certainly give it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we can probably talk about that afterwards and I can give you research. And there's an article, a reference for the article there where you can get more information, but that's a really good question. Um, and so with the work that he did by inducing seizures with rocket fuel, what he discovered was that SMR trained cats were generally more resistant to seizures than the other cats who were not trained to increase their SMR. 25% of the cats who were trained were also completely seizure free and 75% of those cats who learned how to increase their SMR were able to resist seizures for more than twice the ability of the, the other cats. And so this is foundational work that really shaped um, neurofeedback training, especially with regard to treatment or training for seizure disorder. And there's a lot of research and work around how neurofeedback training can be applied to help individuals with this kind of disorder. 
with near feedback training in general, balance is a key and the, the, what we're looking for is training the brain to be both flexible and resilient. In our normal day-to-day -day lives, we have to be flexible, right? We have to be able to roll with the punches. We have a perfect plan, stuff happens. <laughs> you can't keep stuck <laughs> in the same mode. We have to adapt and change so that we can respond optimally. Um, but we also have to be resilient. So not only do things change, but there's adversity, right? There's trauma, um, unexpected things happen. And so we also have to be resi resilient in order to be able to bounce back. Our brains are no different. Our brains need to be flexible and they also need to be resilient. And we have the capacity for this to happen. And neurofeedback training allows us to improve our capacity to be both resilient and flexible. So quick takeaways from the first part of the presentation, EEG biofeedback or neurofeedback training helps us to increase both the level of flexibility and resilience of our brains by using the EEG to see our brain waves. So we talked a little bit about uh, arousal. We're gonna dig a little deeper into arousal systems in our bodies, but what neurofeedback training does because of the work that, that it helps us to do to regulate our brains. It affects several systems and processes in our bodies. So mood and emotions can be regulated through neurofeedback training. The level of arousal can be changed. So if you think of arousal, maybe the best way to think of it is in terms of a continuum, right? So if the highest form of arousal would be like a manic state, you know, what do you think would be kind of the lowest form of arousal in our bodies? Say that again, coma. Yay, yeah, so a coma, right? So it's like heightened state of arousal and arousal levels so low that you're essentially comatose, right? And then there are variations in between. Um, neurofeedback is a tech, this technology that will help us to regulate our levels of arousal. As I'm standing here talking right now, there's a lot that's going on. Um, my thoughts are probably racing because, and I have to have a heightened state of arousal in order to be present and focused in order to be able to remember what I read and what I prepared. Um, but my arousal level can't be too high because it's gonna interfere with my ability to communicate effectively. So there is an appropriate level of arousal that helps us to perform <coughs> optimally. And that's kind of the balance that we're trying to, to influence with neurofeedback training. Um, neurofeedback training, and I can attest to this, is very, very helpful in regulating the sleep cycle. I think Dr. Kathy can attest to that too. <laughs> Um, I think the first time we did training for you, Dr. Kathy, you noticed immediate um, effects in terms of your, your sleep patterns. Um, and that's one of the things that you'll see. It does regulate your, your sleeping because sometimes sleeping can be disordered. Um, so sometimes individuals have trouble falling asleep. Sometimes they're able to fall asleep, but then they have difficulty with waking up several times during the night because of disordered arousal perhaps. And so newer feedback training helps to regulate that mm -hmm. process as well. Um, it's also very helpful for sensory processing and cognitive processing issues as well as motor responses. Um, and so I think when you think of sensory processing and cognitive processing, what are some of the disorders that you think could potentially be influenced if newer feedback training can influence that process? Think about some of the, <clears throat> the kids that you see um, with sensory and- Definitely awesome. Yes, absolutely, right? There are lots of cognitive processing and sensory processing issues with kids diagnosed with autism. And we see the same thing with kids with ADHD as well, right? So we have all these diagnostic labels, which we really need. Um, but a lot of the times, because the same brain structures and systems are affected, they look the same way. So a child um, with ADHD with high levels of hyperactivity can look very similar to a child with complex trauma. And the thing that unifies them is the heightened state of arousal. So you're on high all the time internally when you really don't need to be. And that's what you see with, with people with complex trauma. They're hyper alert, they're hyper aware, very, very vigilant because of what's going on with their arousal system. And so what training does is to help them to be more aware of what's going on internally. And if you're aware, you have the power to change it and regulate that level of arousal. 
<clears throat> so like you said before, some of the broad clinical applications for neurofeedback training, epilepsy, no surprise, you know, based on how this um, training and technology emerged. ADHD, ADD, um, there's re strong research support for addiction, PTSD, anxiety, depression, traumatic brain injury as well. <clears throat> Panic attack, um, a range of different kinds of conditions can be uh, influenced positively by neurofeedback training because of the basic premise that we're able to detect our arousal systems and regulate um, our arousal levels. So we're gonna segue a little bit into some of the research. I'm not gonna dig too deeply in it because you have the PowerPoint so you can read um, on your own. But there is quite a bit of research that is guiding um, neurofeedback as a training modality. And I think what we find is a lot of case examples during which we're finding that clinical experience has been consistently positive for people who use neurofeedback training. I think what's also evident is Typically, people are discovering neurofeedback training after they've exhausted all other possible conventional approaches. I remember in North Carolina, Professor Hamlin talked about the fact he works a lot with neurologists in the area with people diagnosed with seizure disorders. And typically, these people are on medications practically for the rest of their lives. And so what he found was that a lot of his referrals were from neurologists who have they did everything that they could possibly do with no positive changes after a while you, you get a certain degree of improvement and there's no nothing more that you can do he gets a lot of those referrals and once he starts to use neurofeedback training he really has seen surprising recovery in terms of the people's ability to respond to training in neurofeedback and so he talked a little bit about people who are on medication for most of their lives being able to go off medication with consistent neurofeedback training. So it's really powerful. Can I add something to that? Yes. Uh, but some of you already know, because I'm pretty open about it. I've had migraines since I was 10 years old. Probably more than that. With the neurofeedback machine, I have not had another single migraine since the first time I was on that machine. And I am totally off my migraine medication, totally. And we have another patient that came in who's had, who has migraines, who's had the same results. So CES is really, really good for migraines. And that's why we have different kinds. They have a sweet spot that they're really, really good at. And if anybody in here has migraines, I highly, highly recommend. Thank you, Dr. Kathy. And I think when we have the Q&A, Eric and I can probably share a little bit about our like clinical experiences with patients that we tag team on. Um, and so we can talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, so in the literature right now, there is substantial research evidence for neurofeedback training for a range of disorders, including ADHD, like I said before, epilepsy, anxiety, addictive disorders, um, TBI, uh, autism spectrum disorder. I will not go deeply into the research, but I did want to bring your attention to seizure disorders since we've talked so much about it already. Um, so there was a meta-analysis that was done in 2000 of um, about 19 studies that were produced looking at the effect of neurofeedback training on seizure disorders. And no surprise, they found that that 82% of participants who participated in neurofeedback training demonstrated reduction in seizures averaging more than 50%. Um, that, that is just a staggering um, change. Of those who saw a good improvement, 5% of them remained seizure free for one year, and it could be more. They were not able to track everyone um, during the follow up, but this is really um, powerful. There is also substantial research for addictive disorders. Um, they found in this particular study that was done in 2005 that after receiving neurofeedback training, the protocol that they use is beta SMR with alpha theta training. We're gonna talk a little bit more about what those <laughs> terms mean. Um, but for this particular study, um, the, the training that they did, they saw at the end of the, the time frame 
really good improvement in terms of the participants' ability to remain substance-free for a year compared to individuals who did not receive near feedback training. So um, quick takeaway for research. There is a lot of research evidence to support the efficacy of neurofeedback. However, more and better research needs to be done. Um, I, I'm thinking of my hero, one of my heroes in the mental health field, Bessel van der Kolk. Um, he is a strong advocate for neurofeedback training. Um, he got me excited about it, and he's working really, really hard to further the field to get research dollars because we don't have a lot of research dollars right now for neurofeedback training. A lot of the funding um, is very much concentrated on pharmacological interventions. And so he, I feel he's at the forefront of the field, really trying to help us to get more research dollars to do this. So I'm gonna switch real quickly again, Eric, um, to another quick present, uh, presentation, just to give a, a general idea of how neurofeedback training can be applied. Was a little guy. Mm -hmm. no, Hi, this is my colleague. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. As a developmental disorder, the child has missed out on what he needed to learn in that first year of life. He needed to learn emotional self regulation, physical awareness, how to interact with the world. Say thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, Josh. See you later. Can you guys hear yeah. okay? Yeah, I'll see you later. Since that, that right brain that was maturing in that first year did not learn how to calm down, we have now, even many years later, we have uh, a right brain that's sort of on fire. Everything to this type of brain is overwhelming, you know, which is why oftentimes you know, autistic individuals like things to be very routine and very predictable. There is no real medical model for treating autism. I definitely feel that neurofeedback you know, uh, fills that hole. I'm going to be a sandwich trainer. Because I have to It's been such an emotional roller coaster with him over the years of having autism, um, going to school, not going to school. We were told it was gas. We were told it was, um, you know, she was sensitive, um, or maybe she was allergic to certain foods or whatever. But we now we know it was sensory integration disorder, you know, related to autism. All of a sudden, I heard a lady yell, "Why are you yelling at me? You shouldn't be yelling at me, young man." I looked at her and I said, is there a problem here? She goes, your son was yelling at me and I think that's very disrespectful. Okay, he's, he's got autism and, and he, he makes noises, but I don't, I don't think he was yelling at you. Well, he should wear a sign or something that says I have autism. We like to think of neurofeedback as a brain exercise where we're specifically exercising the brain's ability to manage its own states. So to be calm enough, to be awake enough, to be focused enough to do what you want to do um, is the goal. It's like brain yoga in a way, you know, there's a stretching and a strengthening. This type of brain exercise, I think, can really have a profound effect on, on uh, helping people just feel and function the way, you know, the way they were meant to. And just like a mother wants to shape the child's behavior, we do this one level down at the level of brain behavior. I know some moms that have kids that are really autistic and have a hard time get them to bed, get them to eat, get them up to school, and they haven't seen their own feedback. And I'm glad I found it.
Here's how it goes. At 305, the door swings open. And there, and there on, in the other room stands Nora. You may come in, come along. What neurofeedback basically is, is that it's a process whereby a person is essentially learning to exercise their own brainwave activity. Oh, boy, oh, boy. And this is a very non-invasive process, and it's extremely powerful. You want to do the alien ship this time? Mm -hmm. OK, we'll do that. What you're doing is you're sitting in front of a video screen. Um, what, you know, it looks to you like you're looking at a, some kind of video game. And there are electrode sensors that are attached to your scalp. Now I put some cat saliva onto my ears and put some cords into my head. This thing, it feels like a cat's licking me. I know, it's kind that of gritty like and wet. That looks time. I was really afraid when she went to stick the electrodes to his scalp. I was ready to freak out over that because he, he didn't really like things touching him. He, he responded to that really well. I select which game we should play, either rollerball or the ship one. The feedback process is one in which we show you what your brain is doing. And we typically show you in terms of a game, so video, audio, video display, that proceeds when your brain calms down and does not proceed when you're not calming down. So you are step-by-step step rewarded for going in a calming direction. The most rewarding thing is just seeing how happy he is and also how happy the rest of his family is. It's incredible, not just what neurofeedback does for individuals, but for all the people around him. So we won't have time to go into Lily's case, um, just so that we were mindful um, so I'm going to switch back but to you can see these are on YouTube, so you can get to Yeah. Okay, so we're going to dig a little bit into the weeds of um, EEGs, uh, what that is and how to understand it within the context of neurofeedback training. Um, how do we measure um, EEG? For this section, what I'm hoping that we'll be able to accomplish um, is, number one, describe the basic properties of the EEG, identify four basic EEG frequency bandwidths and their arousal states. We all already have been introduced to SMR um, in the work that Barry Stearman did, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then finally, I hope that you'll be able to better understand the relationship between EEG and brain regulation. Does anyone know what EEG stands for? <laughs> it's a really big word and it's hard to pronounce. Electroencephalogram. Um, and so, but I won't be saying that over and over. So whenever I say EEG, that's what I mean. Um, it's a, a way of, of measuring brainwave activity. Um, so where, how did we find out about brainwave patterns and EEG as a way of monitoring what's going on? We've known that there is electrical activity in our brains from as early as 1875, thanks to a British physician who discovered this. By 1924, we were able to amplify that electrical activity, and, uh, and, and we were also able to trace this electrical activity on paper. Now we're able to, to do so um, using more advanced technology, but these were really, really early developments into what was going on with our brain. And through that early work, um, we discovered that there are rhythmic fluctuations or changes in brainwave patterns, which correspond to different levels of arousal, like we talked about before, different levels of consciousness. We talked about consciousness and arousal levels being on a continuum. So we'll try to make better sense of that later on as the presentation continues. Um, we were using EEG clinically um, from as early as the 1930s in terms of investigative and research work. One of the, the first papers that were published around abnormalities in EEG patterns was published in 1938. So this work has been going on for a while. 
Um, what happened though was that this early work was superseded by some of the advancements in, the, in mental health at the time. So behaviorism, Skinner, <laughs> Watson, that was huge, rose in prominence. I think what also dominated and probably still dominates um, currently is chemical Im imbalance as a way of understanding what's going on with our mental health disorders. And so the move, behaviorism movement as well as chemical imbalance theories really took over rose in prominence. And so a lot of the early work um, was stalled by those developments, but continued um, nevertheless. And so like I said before, we've been able to apply uh, EEG investigation to a range of disorders, um, including head injury, narcolepsy, um, alcoholism, uh, migraines, like Dr. Kathy said before, reducing aggression, um, multiple sclerosis, OCD, anxiety, a, a lot of different conditions. So how do we capture EEG? I'm going to try to get my pointer going again. Um, so like the little boy described before, <laughs> he said that sensors were placed on his brain. And so we're going to walk through how that works. So in order for us to capture EEG on the systems that we use, sensors are placed on the, the client's scalp. And what the sensor does is it helps us to record the signals of all the brain waves, the, the fluctuations in electrical activity that are occurring. And so if you look at the diagram, I don't know if you can see the little pointer. So we place those sensors here um, to approximate certain states or, or sites on the brain. Um, the cere cerebral cortex is right here. Um, these are where all the, the brain cells are. There's an electrical charge that is brought about by a stimulation from surrounding brain cells. And that electrical charge and stimulation is what generates the electrical field, which becomes a source of the EEG. So there's a lot of neuro, neuronal firing that's happening. And what, when we place the sensors on the individual scalp, we're able to capture what's the vibrations and all that's going on um, with our sensors. When we talk about neurofeedback training and EEG, um, you'll hear frequencies um, talked about a lot and herds. And so I just wanted to um, define these a little clearer so that um, it makes sense as we're going along. So what is frequency? So we talked about the SMR frequency band and there are different um, bands that we'll look at later on. So frequency is defined as the unit of measure for the number of times a wave occurs in one second. And hertz is a unit of frequency that's equal to one cycle per second. So um, if you look at the little diagram here, at the peak, if you measure the number of peaks in this wave, they're about 20, I think. And so over a time period of one second wave, a particular wavelength that's replicating itself 20 times per second, it's said to have a frequency of 20 hertz. So frequency is a way of measuring the kind of activity that's going on, um, electrical activity that's going on. And so that's essentially what that means. We'll also talk about amplitude. So whereas the frequency measures kind of the speed of the brain waves, the amplitude measures the power of the brain waves. So amplitude is defined as the unit of measure that describes the power of a wave from highest peak to the lowest peak. So again, if you take a second to look at the diagram, the highest peak would be here, lowest peak would be here, and that would kind of capture the amplitude of the wave. So again, when you think of higher frequency, think speed. Um, so if you were looking at, you know, brain waves are going like this, they're going really high. So typically higher frequency or higher speed means that the amplitude or power is lower and the Lower frequency typically means that the amplitude is, is stronger or more powerful. So I mentioned earlier that we would dig a little deeper into the different kinds of brain waves, and we're going to look at that. So when we talk about EEG frequency and am amplitudes, ones that are presented there are kind of the, the key ones that we talk about in the field. So at the top, if you notice the brainwave patterns for beta waves is very different from theta waves, for example. So beta waves, we talked about frequency, measure between 14 and 30 hertz. They're higher frequency. And look at the states that those kinds of brainwaves are. I'm producing a lot of <laughs> beta brainwaves right now, right? So beta brainwaves are associated, associated with an awakened kind of normal alert state 
So it's a heightened level of, of consciousness. Um, compare that to theta waves at the bottom, close to the bottom. Theta waves measure about four to eight hertz. They're, the pattern definitely looks different from the ones at the top, right? So it's slower frequency and theta waves are um, usually associated with a reduced level of consciousness. Consciousness is the kind of waves that we produce when we cross over from being awake to being asleep, there's that period when we make that crossover, we produce a lot of theta waves in that space. Um, theta waves are also very powerful and they're produced, they're very prevalent when we're realizing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So if any of you are drifting off during the presentation, <laughs> you may be producing some theta waves. Um, <laughs> So delta waves, delta waves, they're slower than the ones that I talked about before. They measure between zero to four hertz. Um, delta waves are associated with sleep. Um, and so if everything's normal, what you'd expect is that delta waves will be low when you're awake. So if you're sitting here today and you're producing a lot of delta waves, you're probably really sleepy, maybe distracted and have difficulty paying attention. And we see that with some of the conditions, right, that we, that we treat or train. Um, so if you're producing too much delta when you're awake, that will interrupt with your cognitive and emotional processing. Um, it also may be associated with head injury. And so Eric and I working with this client with TBI, um, we've not done an EEG assessment, but we can probably assume that with that individual, he's producing a lot of delta waves in some parts of his brain. And so we have to help him to regulate the level of arousal in, in his brain. Um, can anyone think of a condition that we would treat with other interventions where someone may be producing a lot of delta waves when they're like awake and walking around and they're normalized? Say that again. Narcolepsy, um, ADHD as well, right? So, um, or maybe for the attention deficit aspect of it anyway. So typically if a child is in a classroom um, with ADHD, it's really hard for them to focus if they're producing a lot of slower brain waves, right? Um, and so what you wanna do is to increase their level of arousal, which is ironic because they're hyperactive, <laughs> but increasing the level of arousal so they're producing higher frequency brain waves that help them to focus. So kids with ADHD are typically producing slower frequency waves. So they're asleep while they're in the classroom trying to pay attention and we're trying to get them to listen and learn, but they're not producing optimal brain waves to help them to learn. And so neurofeedback training um, helps us to up train or increase um, the level of arousal so they can focus and concentrate. Um, Theta waves, can anyone remind me what theta waves are? Like, when do we produce theta waves? Who wants to, to take a guess at it? During meditation. Yes, very good, right? So very, when we're in meditative states, we can produce uh, theta waves. So visualization for people who are highly visual, Dr. Kathy, you're a very visual person. <laughs> you're probably producing a, a lot of theater waves sometimes when you're at your office just typing. Um, it, they allow us to also be very inwardly focused um, within the normal range. When we're daydreaming and kind of spacey, we're producing a lot of theater brain waves as well. And so when we're excessive or too much theater waves can be problematic when your eyes are open and you're engaged in a task. And again, we'll see this with disorders um, where an attention deficit is a problem. It's really hard to focus if you're producing a lot of sleepy waves. Um, alpha, when I think alpha, I think Shu. <laughs> she was gonna be talking a lot about how to keep us in an alpha state even as we're going around our, our daily lives. Um, so alpha brain waves measure between eight to 12 hertz, and they're the dominant frequency that you produce when your eyes are closed. I'm just gonna ask you to do something really quickly. Can everybody just close your eyes for a minute? And as you're sitting there with your eyes closed, I just want you to be aware of what's going on internally inside in your bodies. All right, you can open them up. <laughs> okay, so 
in that minute that we paused for your eyes to be closed, you produced more alpha waves than you're probably producing before. And I'm curious to know if you detected any changes internally. So by changes, remember we talked a little bit about arousal levels and physiologically what we we're able to track. So your breathing rate, your heart rate, um, body temperature. So did anyone, and it's not long enough, but if you sat there long enough with your eyes closed, you're going to notice some things changing, right? So was anybody able to detect any change once your eyes were closed? Can you tell us? I felt more relaxed, um, slowed down my breathing. I also was aware of things. I wasn't aware of like my throat feeling kind of dry sore. like mine. Dry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good, right? And that was one minute. Rashad? Yeah, my breathing increased. I don't know if I was nervous or not, but it increased It's interesting. I wonder why your breathing increased. <laughs> what, what, were you thinking about something that no, I, heightened I your know, arousal? I didn't think I was thinking. Very good. So hopefully if you sat like that for another five minutes, um, you probably would have been able to, you can you could regulate your, your heart rate by regulating your breathing. So without using any software connecting you to any technology, you were able to affect change with the brain waves that you were producing. How powerful is that, right? Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on. So alpha waves, again, measure 8 to 12 hertz when we're spacey, daydreamy, and really, really relaxed. Um, this is what we produce. So excessive alpha, though, can appear as spaciness, um, unmotivated, inattentive, and depressed. So can anyone guess, especially for the unmotivated um, descriptor, can you think of any kind of disorder where excessive alpha waves might be going on that might affect motivation and drive. Depression. Say that again. Depression. Depression, exactly, right? Because remember we talked about mood being affected by our brain waves. So absolutely, you'll find that um, if you're sluggish and depressed physiologically, it's usually associated with a depressed mood. It's like everything is coming down, right? And so with, with training, neurofeedback training for depressed people, what we want to do is to rev things up, right? So neurofeedback training, we talk about left side and right side training for depressed people. They're chronically under aroused. And so if you're under aroused, you're feeling sluggish and sleepy, um, we want to press the accelerator. So we're increasing their arousal system so that they can function um, normally. Um, we talked about SMR, sensory motor rhythm. Those brainwaves measure between 12 to 15 hertz. And they're the ways that we produce when we're calm, externally focused. I'm hoping that I'm producing a lot of these brainwaves right now um, because they're a really happy medium of being alert and focused, but also relaxed, right? If I were too... <laughs> um, sharp and focused, I might be presenting in a manic way with, you know, rapid speech, thoughts racing, so I can't afford to be too aroused. So it's a balance between um, being alert and aroused, but also relaxed and focused. So it's, it's kind of a happy medium, and it really helps us to perform tasks um, optimally. Um, SMR training also helps with increasing calmness, regulating impulsivity, hyperactivity, internal inhibition, um, promoting body awareness as well. I think you all just did that by having your eyes closed. You were more aware of what was going on physiologically in your body when you did that. And we also train SMR to reduce um, anxiety and anger. Beta brainwaves measure between 15 and 18 hertz. They're um, activated ex and helps with external focus and attention. They're the best kind of brain waves for doing or performing tasks. So again, that balance between heightened arousal, but not too much, so that it gets in the way, and then a sense of relaxation. When we train beta um, waves, we help with um, improving sleeping patterns, concentration, and attentiveness. So overall enhancing of cognitive processing. So high beta, um, so we're, the, we're increasing in frequency. So high beta measures between 22 to 36 hertz. And those are the brain waves that you produce when your body is really tense. And so the disorders that you would associate that would be anxiety. 
Um, high beta can be good for some things, right? So can you think of anything that high beta waves might be helpful for? Exercise, Exercise right? Uh, you need to be able to channel some high beta to get you to perform because you're, you're pushing yourself. Like you can't be sluggish when you're trying to lift like 100 pounds, you know, 100 pound weight. So you really need to focus and be highly aroused in order to do that. Um, however, excessive amounts of high beta brainwaves can reflect a high state of arousal, um, excitability, anxiety, being scared, um, highly stressed and tense. Can you think of any of the disorders that we treat that might be associated with, associated with high beta brainwave production? Say that again. Yes. Mania, yes. I heard mania and PTSD, absolutely. Um, Okay, so we're switching focus just for a brief second to talk a little bit about um, EEG assessment. How do we measure and understand um, what's going on with our EEG and electrical brain activity? Um, quantitative EEG is kind of the most developed methodology for assessing and reading and understanding brainwave patterns. That's way above my <laughs> pay grade. It requires specialized training. Um, however, I need you to know that this also exists, right? And so what quantitative EEG allows us to do is to measure and assess what's going on with the electrical activity and compare, um, compa have comparisons to what's considered normal groups, right? So what, what do normal brainwave patterns look like for people, you know, for, for us in general? Like, what are the normal patterns? And so if you know what normal brainwave patterns are, then you can assess what might be going on with, with an individual who has um, TBI, for example. So it helps us to be able to compare disordered um, arousal with what's considered the norm. So the kind of assessment that, that I've been incorporating in the work that I'm doing here and that we'll talk a little bit more about is measuring kind of a crude way of measuring levels of arousal. And so, Arousal is reflected in the level of activation of our autonomic nervous system. So when you think autonomic nervous system, we're thinking about indicators such as Rashad mentioned, his breathing changing, right? So it's what's going on internally. So our heart rate, um, breathing rate, blood pressure, muscle tension, um, or sweat gland activity is being able to assess the different levels of, of arousal and, and changing them or regulating them. So we're not gonna go through all of these because we kind of touched on them before, but I wanted you to excessive or too little and what that might mean for the clients that we see. So delta waves, again, measure between zero to four hertz. And within the normal range, when we're producing delta, you, you'd expect it to be associated with very restful sleep. However, if you're producing too much delta, um, especially when you're awake, then that's typically associated with sluggishness, uh, depression. However, if you're producing too little delta, then you're probably going to have problems with sleep disruption because you're not producing the optimal amount that you need for sleeping restfully. Um, we're just going to go to the bottom. Beta brain waves measure between 15 to 32 hertz in general. Normal amounts, um, you're going to be engaged and focused. I hope you all are producing a lot of beta waves right now. Um, however, too much or excessive beta brain waves are, as usual, associated with tension, difficulty relaxing, a lot of mind chatter. Um, can you think of a condition that might be associated with excessive, another one, excessive? Um, beta brainwaves, especially with regard to the mind chatter. Schizophrenia, that, that's interesting. That's a possibility. The, the one that came immediately to my mind would be bipolar disorder with racing thoughts, um, a lot of mind chatter and activity. Um, and so too little or too few of those, though, are associated with depression. Um, on you know lack of motivation and sluggishness, sluggishness in general. So, um, when it comes to waves and the arousal levels and learning how to regulate these arousal levels, as you're seated here today, every thought that you're thinking, 
every emotion that you're feeling and every sensation that you have right now is due to the rate and combination of the firing of the neurons in your brain. So uh, you're seated here looking really calm, but there's a lot that's going on in your mind right now. There's a lot of electrical activity, a lot of neurons firing off, um, which is a good thing. Um, as you're seated there, especially in a calm, relaxed state, your brain is regenerating and rejuvenating itself. Um, and it's just, just um, it's a beautiful thing. Um, the rate of brainwave firing is related to our states of arousal, as I said before. And so, as you've seen, hopefully um, demonstrated, many of the conditions that we treat result from problems with regulation of arousal. And neurofeedback training helps us to teach people how to regulate and control their levels of arousal. Mm -hmm. On the graph on page 17, where mm -hmm. it shows the picture of the mm -hmm. the different wave brainwave frequencies. Why is that not consistent? Where, like with the delta mm -hmm. speed, it shows a higher frequency and amplitude than, than theta. And theta is supposed to be awake, but meditative and in between. So I don't want to switch between the, the slides because it's going to eat up our time. Um, what, what's the slide number? Um, page 17. Page 17. So say what you're going to say. It, it, it shows, I mean, visually it shows where you would expect the delta to be more awake because there's a lot, the activity looks more intense. More intense than which one? Than theta underneath it, which is just barely showing much. So the theta waves are the ones that we put, so right at the point we were slipping off into sleep is when we produced it, theta waves, right? right. So. It's a lower level of arousal um, compared to, to Delta. It's high, but in, ref, in relation to beta brainwaves at the top, it's, so it's, it's relative to the beta brainwaves, it's really not as high frequency. Um, delta brainwaves at that measurement is, is really low frequency compared to the beta brainwaves. The patterns um, are very different. All right, so do you see the wave patterns though? So higher frequency, there's a lot more of them being produced at the same time with the beta brain waves, higher level of arousal, higher level of consciousness, an awakened and alert state. But theta are, are slower lower. frequency. Yeah, yeah because it's, yeah. so it's slower frequency because remember the state that's, that it's connected to? It's that falling off into mm -hmm. sleep state. So it's definitely slower frequency. If it were, if you're producing a lot of beta brain waves when you're falling asleep, you're probably going to be lying there for two hours trying to fall asleep because there's likely a lot of brain chatter, muscle tension. And so the slower the brain wave is, the more relaxed is the, your state because it's a lower level of arousal. So is that reflecting dreaming then? So yeah, dreaming. Dreaming is probably closer to theta. So theta brain waves again are connected to visualization, um, and so theta are brain waves are connected more closely to to the dreaming state. We can talk about it a little bit more later on. There's a lot of of information on that. So I think, like I said before, one of the laws that guide um, what's the right or appropriate amount of um, arousal, amount of arousal for people would be the Yerkes-Dotson law. So the, there is a relationship between our level of arousal and efficiency for performing tasks. So for me, what I want to have is a medium level of arousal to do what I'm doing now. If I increase my level of arousal any more than it is right now, I'm going to be like manic and <laughs> really high, too high energy, and I'm not a high energy person by nature. <laughs> um, so it would be distracting for me and also distracting for you, and I wouldn't be doing what I need to do in an optimal way. However, if I lowered my level of arousal anymore, I'm going to be drifting off thinking about the 57 things that I have to do. And so a medium level of arousal is typically, generally ideal for us to perform any task efficiently. Um, I'm just going to walk through these slides really quickly. So when we think about different levels of arousal um, and the conditions that are associated with them, 
over arousal, again, like we said before, is typically associated with conditions such as anxiety, sleep onset disorder. So like I was explaining um, just a minute ago, if you're over aroused, it's going to be really, really hard. You're producing higher frequency brain waves as you're trying to sleep. It's going to be really hard to bring your system down in order to rest. Um, conditions of over arousal are also associated with anger and aggression, agitation, hyperactivity, impatience, and of course, a lot of muscle tension. So if you were to, to, to make fists right now and cleanse your body as if you're doing Progressive, mu progressive muscle relaxation, when you tense all your muscles, you're naturally increasing the your arousal, your level of arousal. But when you release the tension, then you're gonna lower your level of arousal. And if you keep doing that, it does promote relaxation. So, Can I yes. Ask something there, just when you talk about aggression. Yeah. Uh, neurofeedback, there's a lot of research now that it's reducing the level of anger and aggression there is a lot of research um, out there about that. And so f for anger and aggression, um, what would be the problem with arousal levels in, in individuals who struggle with, with anger and aggressive behavior? What do you think would be the problem? So we're talking about either being under aroused, over aroused. Um, over exactly right. So over aroused all the time. So if you're angry and aggressive, maybe a lot of mind chatter because you're paranoid about, it, about everything. So there are lots of triggers in your environment. You um, interpret, you know, innocuous looks as threatening. So there's a lot that's going on and you're tense and ready for a fight. So they're, they're chronically over aroused and, and that's how it affects their systems. So on the other extreme though is under arousal. And so someone who is chronically under aroused um, would probably more likely be depressed in terms of their mood, low motivation levels and drive, uh, perhaps problems with attention because higher frequency waves help us to focus and concentrate better, um, poor concentration, uh, sleep disruption as well. And these individuals are typically very sensitive and shy. Unstable arousal. So if, if you have difficulty maintaining um, a particular state of arousal is considered unstable arousal. So we, we talked earlier about needing to balance um, flexibility and resilience in our brain. So if we're unable to maintain a particular stable. So I think like I mentioned before, unstable arousal um, is, can be considered to exist on a continuum. The most unstable kind of arousal would be seizures. Um, and on the lower end of the spectrum would be migraines, asthma, panic attacks. So typical problems that are associated with unstable arousal, migraine headaches, difficulties with emotional regulation, PMS symptoms, and problems with sleep. Disordered arousal is another way of thinking about arousal levels. Um, so when arousal levels are disordered, um, I think the example that stands out to me from the list that I have there is kids with a, a history of dysregulated attachment, right? So they're, it's really, really hard for them to maintain the right levels of arousal. Um, if your brain has been conditioned to be afraid all the time, and you have a mother who is loving and nurturing and caring, um, you approach mom, but then you pull away because it's just really, really hard for you to figure out what to do. Your level of arousal changes so much. So the developmental problems that we typically see associated with disordered arousal, autism spectrum disorder, developmental disabilities, um, explosive anger issues, uh, substance abuse as well. So these are just broad descriptors for different levels of arousal to help us to understand what we need to do in terms of developing a protocol that's going to help help us to achieve the optimum arousal level. Um, so quick takeaways for arousal assessment. Arousal needs to be appropriate for the task demand. And the key is our ability to be able to regulate arousal. Neurofeedback training provides the technique, the tool for us to help clients to regulate their arousal levels. So as a general principle, when we're designing or developing a protocol to help regulate arousal, 
when we're reinforcing a frequency, the faster the frequency band is the higher the level of arousal. So when I think of increasing the frequency band, I think of pressing the accelerator on the car. We're revving things up, so you're increasing the level of arousal for the tasks that you have to do, such as paying attention, doing a tra long training, um, playing football, um, really engaging. So if we're, we're reinforcing or increasing or training up um, a certain uh, frequency band, it's considered to be heightening or increasing arousal. The other end of that is if we're developing a protocol to help someone to lower their arousal level, then we want to train and target a lower frequency band. So for anxiety, um, it's not going to help someone if I train a higher frequency, if I'm increasing or reinforcing a higher frequency band for someone with anxiety, I want to help them to press the brakes on their bodies so that they're not in a heightened state of arousal all the time when it's not necessary. The only time I'd want them to have a lower uh, or a lower state of arousal is when they're falling asleep. Highest state of arousal when you need to engage in a task. Some other takeaways from the arousal model. Many of the physical, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral problems that we treat every day here are related to some extent to problems regulating arousal. Like I said before, arousal levels can be too high, too low, or difficult to maintain. In other words, they're unstable for the task at hand. We can learn through neurofeedback how to improve control of levels of arousal. So I'm gonna do a quick arousal exercise. Um, if you could take one and pass it along and I'll tell you what to do. Does everyone have a pen and pencil? Okay. No? Does anyone have an extra pen or pencil? Thank you. Mary? Okay. Oh, Thank you. Does everyone have one now? Still going around? Does everyone have one? Okay, so what I want you to do is to take a look at these three columns, check the symptoms, experiences that um, are reflective of your kind of normal everyday existence. So you're gonna check the ones, if, if you can relate to them in all three columns. When you're done, I want you to, to sum the number of symptoms that you check for yourself. So under the first far left column, under rows, you're gonna have a total number of symptoms that you check. Same thing for the middle column, same thing for the, the final, the third column.
challenge. Is everybody just about done? <laughs> Liz, that's an interesting expression on your face. <laughs> she said, what does it mean? Talk to me afterwards. <laughs> okay, so I felt like this would bring it home a little bit better for you because I've been talking about levels of arousal, low arousal, unstable arousal, and I feel like this um, is a really good visual um, depiction of the kinds of things that we experience, and it doesn't, we, it doesn't have to be a clinical diagnosis. It's just our normal everyday experience. I know I'm a chronically under aroused person. Does that mean that I'm depressed all the time? No, but my energy level is really low on a good day. Coffee doesn't even help me. Um, so <laughs> I go about my day um, preserving my energy as much as I can because I'm not starting with a lot to begin with so I know that about myself and so <laughs> meditation is important to me right because I have to be able to, to calm myself so that I have resources from which to, to pull from when others are pulling from me and, and on a normal everyday basis so don't be alarmed if you check things that look like they're unstable arousal but I feel like this really helps helps to, to drive things home a little bit so um, we're getting ready to wrap up the neurofeedback training aspect of it. So if you have a total, you have a good sense of where you are in the spectrum in terms of, of arousal levels. So some of you might fall under more kind of chronically aroused state. Others, you may be more over aroused and under aroused in your normal everyday lives. And then for others of you, you may have a history, like a history of migraines, for example, would indicate that um, instability in arousal levels. And so, Sometimes you'll find that there are people who have even numbers. So under the arousal category, they may have 10 symptoms that they experience. Over arousal, they may also have 10. So what this does is, is it helps us to figure out a protocol that would match the arousal level that would be appropriate for that particular person. So it's very specific. Um, what I'm gonna do, or as I'm getting ready to wrap up, Somebody sitting here has a package of handouts with a little brain exercising. If you have that on the very last page, so the page after this, you win a free neurofeedback training session at some point today if you have time. So look, who has the brain training? Please, oh! <laughs> okay, wow. What a fitting one, okay. <laughs> So Rashad has a little brain um, pushing the barbells. So I, what, I'm going to use your arousal screener okay. to tailor a protocol um, that, that would be right for you based on what you tell me there. Um, as we're wrapping up, we don't have time because I talk too long. We don't have the time to do a demonstration. What I was going to do is to invite you to go to the biofeedback room after we have a break. However, I'm available today, um, so as a part of your training, if you had time, I could do demonstrations um, you know, at your convenience and with my timing as well. Um, and we could do a demonstration there, but Rashad is gonna have an opportunity to experience um, training for himself. Um, so, wrapping up one more video. So what I wanted to do with this video is to review what we've already talked about um, so that you're walking away. We dove into a lot of details and went through the weeds a little bit. So I just wanted to bring the key points home again for you. Hi, this is Mike Cohen. I first took my dad to neurofeedback in 1995. He was struggling with severe agitation. We went to top doctors, nothing worked. Then we found neurofeedback and the effect on him was remarkable. Ever since, I've worked with neurofeedback. So when people ask, what is neurofeedback? They typically want to know how you do it, what it helps, and how it's different than other options. With neurofeedback, anyone can improve their brain. We train children, teenagers, and adults from age two to 92. For children, it's often used for ADHD, emotional and behavioral issues, learning and developmental delays, and struggles in school. For adults, it's commonly used for anxiety, depression, obsessing, and sleep problems. Neurofeedback measures brain activity, like brain waves, and it helps you make more or less of certain brain patterns. By changing brain activity, or by changing how one area of the brain talks to another, 
you can improve attention, control of your emotions, and behavior. There's research on how it helps migraines, pain, concussions, addiction, and seizures. But what do all these have in common? They're brain issues. With neurofeedback, your brain changes itself. And when it does, typically any of these issues improve. It's not all about problems. Neurofeedback improves performance by changing the timing of the brain. That can help anyone in performing in school, business, or sports. It helps give you an edge. Neurofeedback is different from brain games like lumosity or tutoring or therapy. Those focus on changing your skills or behavior or how you think. Neurofeedback is focused on changing the brain. There are parts of your brain that help you pay attention, that help you be calm, that help manage your mood, or that help you sleep. You don't realize how much your brain affects your mind. With neurofeedback, you get to see how changing your brain can have a huge impact on your life. How do you do neurofeedback? First, we put sensors on your head. Commonly, we measure your EEG brain activity with a special computerized system. The system gives you feedback, such as playing a movie or hearing a beep. For example, when you make a certain amount of beta brain waves, the movie will play perfectly. But as soon as you're less alert and awake, the movie starts to fade out. You rapidly learn how to keep the movie from fading out by changing the brain activity that's being trained. Your brain has a way of figuring out how to get the movie to play. Once you learn new patterns, and that may take practice, your brain tends to remember it. There's a lot of published research that shows that the brain learns from feedback and that measurable changes in brain activity occur after training. So how do you change your brain? It's just learning. Children learn to play a video game and they never read a manual. Their brain figures it out. How do you balance on a bike and not fall over? Somebody probably showed you, but it's your brain that figured out how to balance. When you train brain activity, your brain figures out how to balance its own activity. So once you train the brain, does it stick? Well, you don't forget how to ride a bike, even if you hadn't ridden in 10 years. It's the same with neurofeedback. Once your brain learns, you don't tend to forget it. There are exceptions, particularly if there's disease like Alzheimer's or neurological issues, but there are still ways to train your brain. The changes you make with neurofeedback can over time have a profound effect on learning, memory, attention, mood, migraines, and far more. If you or someone you know could benefit from improving their brain, we encourage you to learn more. You can visit our website at centerforbrain.com. You can visit their website or you can contact any of us um, and just you know, schedule some time to experience it yourself. Um, I've worked with clinicians when we just started working on this um, last year. There were referrals that were being considered and I've um, just connected with clinicians who thought this might be helpful for their clients. I've walked them through it so they can experience it themselves so that they're conversant in what we're doing if they're recommending this for their clients. So thank you for your attention. Um, this is a lot of heavy information and you, you were really focused and engaged and I appreciate your attention and time. We're going to take a break 10 minutes, guys. Is that okay? Um, and then when you come back from the break, um, Eric is going to take over from here.